Good morning, everybody, and welcome to it's Monday, September 10th, 2018, Santa Rosa County Commission meeting for today. Before we get started, a couple things that we're now on the eve of one of the worst disasters in American history, and tomorrow everybody will remember where they were on September 11th, 2001, 17 years ago. And the folks that passed away in Shanksville, Pennsylvania, Twin Towers, and of course at the Pentagon. It's a day that's woven into the fabric of each of us, and it's woven into the fabric of our country. I'm going to ask Commissioner Salter this morning if he'll lead us in the pledge, and Commissioner Parker if he'll please lead us in prayer. And let's all take a moment and remember that day. Uh, I don't call it an anniversary. I can't quite get to where an anniversary is supposed to be a happy thing. So I, I believe it's a day that, just like Pearl Harbor, goes down in infamy in this country and will continue to be part of our fabric the rest of the time this country's God chooses to keep this country around. So all please rise. Thank you, gentlemen. Everybody would please put their cell phones on a silent mode, and if you come up to speak today, we do need a speaker's form filled out. And when you approach the podium, please uh, give us your name and address for the record. Uh, this morning, our first thing on this morning's agenda is a presentation of the Spencer Field Traffic Study from Genesis Engineering. Commissioner Parker, would you like to introduce your guest? Yes, sir. I believe we have uh, Genesis Engineering here, and he's going to go through as um, just anybody here that doesn't remember back in February of 2017, I brought this uh, forward to the board, and um, we decided after a deliberation to uh, take on a firm, and Genesis wound up being that firm to help us to uh, better ensure that decisions we made to impact traffic functionality and improve pedestrian safety uh, were the correct ones and not just, you know. So uh, hopefully today you will share with us some of the science behind uh, the alternatives that we're looking at and, and a way that we can improve the community as we grow. Yes, sir. Good morning. I'm Mark Long Jr. with Genesis. I'm here today with Heather Van Ash and Tracy Forrester. Uh, we love the opportunity to work on the Spencer Field traffic analysis. Um, as you can see, there's, there's quite a bit of content in this analysis. And today I'm just going to go over a, a brief overview of the recommendations that we make. Um, please feel free to cut me off at any time if you have a question. Uh, I'd be more than happy to answer any questions that you have. Let's see here. So this study is involves the intersections that surround the naval outlying field this is where they do the helicopter training the red circles on the image you see are the intersections that we evaluated there's seven of them in total two signalized intersections and five uh, stop controlled intersections the big blue box on the right that's the outlying field and the smaller box on the left that's pace high school that that plays into this study so we'll we'll get into that in a moment so the recommendations that we make in this report are based off of several different factors. Um, we conducted a GIS mapping analysis to fully understand the existing conditions surrounding the intersections. We did uh, three days of 16-hour turning movement counts. That's how we collect all the data so that we can model the existing issue, and we made site observations. We also looked at the last three years of accident reports to try to see if there was a, a theme of accidents. Um, we also documented the existing conditions and took all the existing 
modeling and traffic count data that we prepared and, and modeled the, the intersections using uh, traffic modeling software to evaluate the, the traffic concerns. For all the non-signalized intersections, we did a signal warrant study. That was to determine whether or not the intersection needed to be signalized or not. And we also prepared alternatives based off of all the analysis that we conducted for improvement at each intersection. So right off the back, I'm going to say traffic calming several times in this presentation. And what I mean by that is there's, there's two main um, opportunities for traffic calming that we've identified. That is the traffic chicane and the speed hump. These come into play for our recommendations that remove stop signs. So right now at several of these intersections, the stop sign acts as the traffic calming. And our recommendations involve removing the stop sign but retaining the traffic calming that they're providing now through the use of either the chicane or the speed hump. The chicane is the picture you see on the left. That's a, that provides horizontal deflection that slows vehicles down. It involves constructing a, a landscape area. It provides aesthetic opportunities. It's more expensive than the speed hump and it's not easily removed. The Less expensive option is the speed hump. That provides the same level of traffic calming, but they're, they're cheap, they're easy. If they don't work out, they can be removed easily. Um, so those are the two options that you can go down when I talk about traffic calming at these intersections. Uh, the other thing that you're going to see in this presentation on the bottom right of the recommendations is a little price tag. That's a a ballpark cost estimate of the design and construction fees for each of the alternatives that we came up with. That's just to give you an idea of, in dollar bills, what we're talking about. So I'm going to start on the, the north side of the project at Berry Hill on the uh, West, West Spencer Field Road and work my way counterclockwise around each intersection. So the first intersection we looked at is West Spencer Field, Berry Hill, and King George. This provides um, access to the Hammersmith neighborhood. Some of the issues that we observed are vehicles traveling westbound as they approach this intersection and turn left to go south. They drive over the traffic loop that's on the northbound approach. What the, the traffic loop is, it's actually in the asphalt, and it's what tells the signal when there's a vehicle there. So what's happening at this intersection during peak periods is that traffic loop gets hit unnecessarily, causes the intersection to think that there's a car northbound even when there's not, and it causes delay. Uh, we also observed excessive delay at this intersection. Um, another item of concern is the north and southbound directions share a, a green phase, and, or they, they don't share a green phase. Each have their own green phase. And what that does is it takes a little bit of time away from the main line, east and west. So what do we do about it? Our first recommendation for this intersection is to modify the signal timing provide peak hour signal times for the worst case scenario. And also the, the northbound approach here right now has a, a dedicated left through and a dedicated right lane. We want to swap those so that the through lane goes with the right. That will improve the signal and functionality of the intersection. Um, in addition to that, modifying the signal timing so that the north and southbound lanes share a green, that will give more time to the main line that goes east and west. The downside of that is it, it increases delay slightly for people coming out of Hammersmith, but across the board it improves the functionality of the intersection. So this is the, the quick, easy fix that um, doesn't build much capacity into the intersection, but it will resolve some of the issues. It will reduce the delay a little bit. Um, the more in-depth solution, the long-term solution, is to construct additional turn lanes. So this is an alternative recommendation that involves adding a eastbound right turn lane and two southbound turn lanes. The, the downside here is that the, the nice sign that's in front of the Hammersmith neighborhood will need to be relocated. What this does is builds capacity into the intersection, significantly improves the operation and reduces the delay. These improvements come with a $250,000 price tag for design and construction. You said to interrupt you what, what you wanted. You go back to that picture. What if they, uh, was there any analysis done of if you left Hammersmith alone but went ahead and did the right turn lane uh, for your eastbound traffic? Yes, yeah, so we, we modeled all alternatives. Um, so in this case, each turn lane you add has a benefit. 
So we could tell you exactly what the benefit is for if you only do the westbound right turn lane versus if you wanted to keep the sign, you could probably add the southbound right turn lane coming out of Hammersmith and retain the sign. There's enough width there. That would also provide benefit. Okay, thank you. So this is the, if you did everything, alternative. So for roundabouts, we looked at, we modeled a roundabout at every single intersection we studied just to look at it from an operation standpoint. And they say right up front, there's not a single intersection in the study that there's enough right of way available currently to do a roundabout, but we wanted to look at it so that the county understands the, the options that they have. Um, the roundabouts all perform very well from a traffic um, from a traffic perspective. They provide traffic calming, aesthetic opportunities, and increased safety. Um, this one comes with a $300,000 price tag. Um, if there's any appetite for going the roundabout route, we can look into those. So working our way south from that intersection, this is the northwest corner of Spencer Field. This is a four-way stop controlled intersection that provides access to Benny Russell Park. Um, if you're going eastbound towards this intersection today, there's a slight sight distance impediment due to the vegetation on the southwest corner of the intersection. We also observed excessive northbound and southbound queues. However, the traffic volumes at this intersection don't justify, uh, don't warrant a signal. They're not, they're not quite that high. So our recommendation here is to eliminate the northbound and southbound stop sign while providing the traffic calming on the northbound southbound approach. So the way that works, if you're the front car and you're coming up to a speed hump, you slow down, you navigate the speed hump and you speed up. The car behind you is navigating that speed hump or chicane while you're speeding up and that provides a gap between the two vehicles that allows side streets to turn out onto the main line. Um, also, we have recommendations to improve the pedestrian crossing signage. Um, so this pavement marking modification within the existing footprint of the intersection and eliminating the stop signs, design and construction is $25,000. That's if you go with the speed humps. Um, the chicanes are more expensive than that. We also took a look at a roundabout this intersection. Again, there's not right of way. Um, if you want to go down in that direction, they perform very well. And this would provide a, a great um, gateway into Benny Russell Park that's immediately to the west of this intersection. Heading south, this is the uh, southwest corner of the Naval Outlying Field. This is West Spencer Field, South Spencer Field, and Giddens. This is an existing four-way stop controlled intersection that's, that's offset, as you can see. Now, this intersection causes a few problems because um, Pace High School is immediately to the south of this intersection. They come down Norris when they get cut loose and they head north on West Spencer Field Road and they hit this stop sign at this intersection. And during peak periods, those cars stack all the way into Norris so that it gets jammed up at Giddens and it jams up the Norris Road intersection as well. Uh, we, the traffic volumes are fairly high at this intersection. We did a signal warrant and it is warranted for a signal. So our main recommendation here is to signalize the intersection. That will allow coordination between this signal and the signal just at the south at Norris. Um, to do that, we got to get rid of that offset. So either Giddens or South Spencer Field Road will need to be realigned to accommodate the signalized intersection. Um, this will eliminate the four-way stop, improve the operational performance of the intersection, and cure the existing problem that's backing up into Norris Road. Uh, this comes with a $350,000 price tag because of the realignment of the roadway. So another alternative improvement for this intersection, um, if we don't want to go down the signalization route, is to eliminate the north and southbound stop sign and provide traffic calming. Um, this, is, this is kind of the, the band-aid approach. There's still going to be delay at this intersection, but it will it'll resolve the, the main issue of vehicles stacking into Norris Road. Um, again, a roundabout would perform very well here and provide the desired uh, traffic calming. Next intersection to the south is Norris Road. This provides the main access to Pace High School. Um, when we went out into the field to, to collect data on this intersection, we pulled the signal timing from the actual signal cabinet that's on the corner, and three of the traffic loops were in fault. Those are the, the loops that are in the pavement that tell the signal when there's a car there. 
And what that means is that the signal was constantly being told that there were cars at each approach when there weren't any cars there. We were able to reset two of those loops and they, they were operating fine. The southbound loop, we couldn't fix right there. That loop actually needs to be replaced. Um, also existing at this intersection, there's crosswalks, at the, but there's no signalized pedestrian crossing. The walk, do not walk signs don't exist. Um, there's also no through movement allowed east and westbound between South Spencer Field and Attaway, but we did observe a lot of people actually making that movement anyway. Also, on Norris, it backs up quite a bit during peak periods, and people have a tendency to cut through the gas station that's on the southwest corner of the intersection and avoid it altogether. So our recommendations for this intersection fit all within the existing footprint of the roadway. We're not proposing any new turn lines. Uh, we want to improve the pavement markings at the intersection, modify the signal timing, uh, modify the signal heads themselves so that they accommodate the intent here is to not allow people to make the through movement east and westbound, and add, uh, add the signalized pedestrian facilities that are necessary for those crosswalks. There's also some minor sidewalk modifications that will be necessary for ADA. That's a $50,000 improvement. Okay, so now we're moving over to the east side of Spencer Field. This is the southeast corner um, at Carlin. This is a four-way stop controlled intersection that we observed uh, significant delays in the northbound, southbound approach. Um, a signal was warranted at this intersection, but just barely. It's right on the line of, of having a signal be necessary. With future development, um, it'll, it'll trigger it for sure. So our recommendation here, since it was right on the line, is to remove the north and southbound stop sign and add traffic calming so that, again, we get the same benefit that the stop sign provided without completely stopping traffic moving through the intersection. Um, we also want to improve the pedestrian signage and pavement markings. Um, similar to the other intersections, this, this type of improvement comes with a $25,000 price tag. The alternative here, and with future development, as more traffic hits this intersection, even with the stop sign removed, you may experience increased delay and in queuing on the east-west movement. Um, so our, our alternative intersection improvement is to signalize this intersection. Um, that will also allow the opportunity to, to coordinate this signal with the signal at Giddens across Spencer Field. Um, with a strain pull design, that's $140,000 design and construction. Um, again, a roundabout is an opportunity here to provide the um, traffic calming that's desired and safety enhancements. Hamilton Bridge Road, this is the Hamilton Bridge Road intersection with East Spencer Field Road. Um, this is the roadway that further to the um, east is going to tie into the Pea Ridge connector. That will obviously impact this intersection. Um, we did, we didn't, the, the queues weren't, weren't too bad, but there was a lot of driver hesitation at this intersection. The west driveway is the access to the naval outlying field, but is very lightly used. Um, also, the crosswalk that's on the southeast corner, that sidewalk doesn't connect due to the utility conflict, so there's not an actual connection there. So our recommendations for this intersection are to eliminate the north and southbound stop sign and provide traffic calming and also to improve the pedestrian uh, pavement markings and signage at the crosswalks and to go ahead while we're out there and make that connection uh, on the southeast corner that, so that sidewalk connects around those utilities. That's a $35,000 improvement. Okay, the last, last intersection is up on the northeast corner of the Naval Outlying Field. This is East Spencer, North Spencer, and Timberland. Uh, we didn't observe any delays here or significant queues. It's kind of an awkward intersection um, because of the, the access to Timber Creek neighborhood. Um, the only issue observed is that northbound and eastbound vehicles are, are stopped unnecessarily at this intersection at the stop sign. Um, so our recommendation is to eliminate that northbound and eastbound stop sign and actually make that 90 degree turn to through movement. What this will require is um, an advisory speed limit drop to 15 miles an hour around that curve and, and signage. We'd also improve the pedestrian signage and pavement markings and make sure all of our, our ramps are ADA accessible. That's a $30,000 improvement. So that's, that's the bird eye, bird's eye view recommendation for each intersection. Um, again, I had a, had a great time working on this project. It was great working with uh, Michael and Chris on this. 
um, appreciate any any questions you have. I'm looking forward to moving forward with the design. Thank you, Mark. Two two quick questions, just uh, for clarification. At Giddens and South Spencer Field, I had the opportunity to talk with Mr. Giddens just uh, right out a week ago, so it wasn't in enough time to, to talk with you ahead of time. Uh, right there, do you feel, I, I'm assuming maybe you showed South Spencer Field realignment, uh, maybe because that was within the right of way. Do you feel like we'd have any cost savings if Mr. Giddens donated some of the land there just north of? Giddens Road there on the northwest corner would that would that function any better if he was willing to donate it, some it more could land for it could away? because of the house that you see on the on the southeast corner and you see how close we're getting to the right of way to right. realign that's a that's a tight fit so from yeah from a that would that would save you in right of way from a construction standpoint either side's got to be realigned okay uh, only other question I had right now was the um and particularly i thought about it on a few of these where we're considering adding in uh, supplemental traffic calming and i noticed that it said pedestrian signs would this be one um and some of probably the neatest that i saw were when we were up in the nashville area where the folks hit the button and it's the yellow pedestrian sign but it's got the the led lights that then flash to notify or what what pedestrian signalization what would that look like Actually. So the the pedestrian signalization that we're recommending is at actual signalized intersection at Norris. So that's that's already a signalized intersection. What we do is add those pedestrian pedestals where yeah you push the button and it, the the walk and do not walk signs come up. The um the I was the, thinking more specifically like the the west and north Spencerfield intersection there at Benny Russell because I know we have some folks that will cross to use the sidewalk and we direct them. I was just wondering what would that look like. That, that's an opportunity. I think what, what you're referring to is a RFB, a rapid, a rectangular rapid flashing beacon, where you push the button and it warns motorists. Right. Um, you, you can do that at, at crosswalks. Um, we didn't make that recommendation because the ped volumes weren't, weren't very high at this intersection, but that's definitely an opportunity. You see that a lot at mid-block crossings, right. kind of further away from the intersection. Okay. It, would that be a significant added expense to what we were looking at? No, I wouldn't say significant. Okay. All right. Thank you, Mark. Mr. Chairman. <clears throat> thank you. Good presentation. Good job. Thank you. Did y'all do any traffic counts on any of those roads out there? Yes, sir. We counted each of the intersections. We did three days worth of counts at each of the intersections that we studied. On. Carlin Drive and, and Spencerfield, there are a lot of houses down in there. Do we know how many vehicles pass through that intersection coming out coming off Carlin? Yes. Yeah, we have we have full blown turning movement counts at, at that intersection. I'm concerned about removing the four way stop signs. Uh, I'm a, I need more time to digest your study, but I'm I'm afraid we're going to be dealing with driver behavior who have, who have been used to those four-way stop signs. So I'm concerned about removing some of them. I think there are probably a couple of them that probably would be okay. But especially on that north-south traffic, I know it backs up, but there's a lot of east-west traffic too, so. Right, we, and, we and Carlin it. is the one that was technically warranted for a signal. It's, it's right on the line. So if you eliminate the north-south stop sign, you'll, you'll have a, a, a much much improved traffic operations at the intersection you're still going to have some delay the the signalized intersection is what would resolve most of that okay and that was the alternative recommendation that we made thank you no problem mark do you feel like uh i noticed in your strand pull alternative for that particular intersection there was no increased capacity as far as turn lanes and that was something i i guess i was informed on well over a year ago when we started down this path that to really get the benefit of an intersection we'll probably have to expand the roadways and, and if you could help me with maybe that was a misnomer because i guess the thought process was is say we got southbound traffic coming south and and they've got a green light so there's no reason for them to slow down or anything but yet northbound we've got a guy that wants to turn left 
and now we're back to, I guess in theory, worse than what we're at now because traffic stacks, signal rolls through red, we've had no movement. Could, could yeah, you help so me what with we, that? I mean, are, if you just help me with how we would benefit with that. Sure, so where we start is we, we look at the existing condition and we look at all the turning movement counts and then we, we model it for multiple different scenarios. So we'll model it for, if you just take out the stop sign, what happens if you signalize it and then we look at different um, signal timing scenarios for that intersection. And you're right, like if you're going northbound because you don't have a dedicated left turn lane and you get jammed up because of the southbound movement moving through, but that, that's all built into the model and, and in our model it didn't happen enough to cause a significant delay. So the approach that we take is we'll, we'll look at the existing condition, why is, it, why is it not operating well, what can we do to improve it, and how, how much do we need to do to improvement. So if we model it and the signal still has issues, then we start adding, adding turn lines. At, at the Carlin intersection, the, the traffic volumes weren't quite high enough to warrant the turn lines, but they would definitely provide a benefit. Like if you if you add in left turn lines, it it, it will definitely provide a benefit. Would um, the the new signal boxes have? I'm, I'm sure the opportunity. I just want to verify that we could build in, such as you were talking about at Giddens and Nor uh, Westminster Field, or sorry, Norris and Westminster Field, that we could give during those peak times, which you obviously already have, and we know it's pretty much that morning and afternoon commute that we could give preference to those directions that were where the abundance of the traffic is. Right, absolutely. So right now at, at Berry Hill and at Norris, both the signalized intersection, they're, they're both running the same signal timing all day, all night long, no matter what. But those cabinets have the capacity built in to put in a custom signal timing for a peak period. So this, we have recommended signal timing configurations in our report that'll add that peak hour signal timing in that'll address that concern. Thank you. Okay, anybody else? Right. Well, thank you very much. It's an issue that I commend Commissioner Parker and Commissioner Salter for working on because uh, we've only seen the situation there get you know, worse heard more complaints, see more growth. So uh, as a board, with something we definitely have to work on. And I'm kind of like Commissioner Salter, I want to digest this a little more before we make some decisions. But it's something I think that County Administrator and Commissioner Parker need to keep moving forward and come back with some recommendations of the board on how uh, possibly go for some of low hanging fruit and get some things working better for those people and then escalate on that so right. thank you thank you mr chairman I, I don't know if you potentially want to see if we i don't know if we have anybody here that wanted to speak to the board on this issue mr mr chairman i had one question i wanted to ask if, if that's okay yeah please uh, on these traffic calming devices which are basically speed bumps is that correct yes yeah, sir there's there's two options one is the chicane and one is the speed hump and they're coming out of West Spencer Field Road we got them on both roads I remember being a high schooler and I, and I have to agree with what Commissioner Salter said traffic uh, the way individuals drive I see these high schoolers going around those speed bumps and driving into the oncoming traffic lane to get around those speed bumps. They do it in people's yards now on our speed bumps. So that's my concern that I wanted the board to maybe think about on, on the coming the traffic coming devices because I know high schoolers <coughs> and none of them drive as like they should on situations when they're getting out of that high school. So that's my concern with the speed bumps is I believe they'll be going around them. When that's, when that's the concern, my recommendation would be to go into the direction of the chicane because the, what the chicane requires is you have actual curb on the outside. And they could always, you know, they're crazy, right? So they could always go on the sidewalk. But the, the curb is provided there to keep people within the confines of the traffic calming, whereas the speed hump is, is much easier to drive around. Mark, I, one, one thing I forgot to ask earlier, um, would this be similar to, I've heard them, discussed in front of us before is a speed table so it's not the super aggressive bump but it's more of a a gradual or is that what we're 
considering here? Sort of. So most of the time when people refer to a speed table, they're talking about like a raised intersection or, a, or like a pedestrian crossing, like a mid-block crossing. Um, those are options here as well. The speed hump is, there's a big difference between a speed hump and a speed bump. The speed hump is right. like that really tight. No one's really using them anymore. You, you shouldn't do it here. It's much more aggressive. The speed hump is, is wider, um, requires you to slow down, but not come to a full stop. And that's why I just want to make sure we clarified for folks we weren't talking about what you see in the parking lot of some, some places. Correct. And um, I don't know, just kind of thinking on the fly, but I guess if we had those areas where maybe we were concerned they would drive around the grass, we could probably just put some of the metal delineators there and uh, those things are extremely cheap. And then I know it's gonna be a lot cheaper than doing a chicane just to put some reflectors there, so. Right, right. The speed humps are about $5,000 a pop. The chicane's around 40 a pop. Yeah. So. And I think we can get those reflectors for probably about 20 bucks a pop, so. Right. All right, thank you. No problem. While you're up there, it brought some of the question to mind. Have they, have they ever, is there records that, you know, for for a trial and error basis, you remove the stop signs and put down these speed bumps that are just the rubberized mats that pin down to the ground to see how it works before you make the investment in a speed table and a, a long-term decision? Yeah, that's that's an option for sure. The um, When you eliminate the stop signs, not a, not a significant expense, uh, but for it to function properly, you would want to go ahead and, and install the speed humps. Yeah. But that, that's, uh, that's my question. Can, on a trial and error basis, take up the stop signs like you suggested, make some of the curves uh, flow better like you suggested, but rather than go to the expense of putting in a permanent table or bump, just put down the rubberized ones. If it works satisfactory, go mm -hmm. ahead and make the investment. If it doesn't, you know, go perhaps to a chicane or something like that. Right, that's, that's definitely an option, and especially if you um, up at Hamilton Bridge Road, because those are going to have to be pretty strategically placed because of the adjacent homes on the near that intersection. So, yeah, it's, that's an opportunity for sure. Okay. Thank you. Folks who would like to speak. Hello, my name is Jeff Marker. I think most of you know me. I live on Sonia Street in Woodbine Springs Plantation. Uh, I had something else to go into, but I'm going to stay focused on what your project is here. Uh, listening to the uh, presentation, I would just like to uh, tell you, which I probably, I'm sure all of you know, Pace, Pace is the, the, the number one growing community in Santa Rosa County right now. There's no question about it. And I'd like to point out, of course, you've got a development coming in right up, right at this intersection. Uh, a lot of D.R. Horton homes going to be built right there on that uh, one corner across from Caddy Quarter from uh, Hammersmith. <clears throat> I think our statistics state that uh, uh, two cars per household state or countywide uh, in Santa Rosa County from some uh, research that I did. But what I'm seeing, uh, and by the way, I'm also a realtor, um, and and I, I think my 15 years of service on the MAC would would um, indicate that I put the citizens first and not myself. What what I see is the families that are moving here, the people that are moving here, are not two car per family homes. They're three car per family. They're four car per family. So when you have a development, I don't have the numbers on, for example, what is going in at that particular intersection, uh, but let's say it's 400 homes. I'm just taking a stab. 400 homes, uh, to me, would mean at least 1,200 more cars going back and forth in this area that you're talking about right now. And of course, none of this information is going to show up in any of the accounts that are being presented to you. Uh, you know, it's the same, the same with the, and of course, I'm sure you all have all more information than I know that, that you may have available, but the same thing applies to the school system. Uh, they're not their typical 2.5 people per home. They're probably more like three and a half because of the, the children that are coming in because they, you know, we have one of the best school systems in the state. So I, 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 I just ask that when you consider all these options that are going forward, I, I have no uh, 
professional knowledge to make a recommendation on any one of them. Uh, you've got a great staff. I've worked with all of them for many years. They know what they're doing. Um, they're sensible people. They're friendly to the citizens. They, they have the, the best interest of our community at heart, I believe. But I, I think when you make these decisions, and I know money is always the, the big deal. You know, wh where do we get the money to keep doing all these things to, to help uh, not just Pace, but, you know, Navarre, Gulf Breeze. We, we all have, there's problems in every community. But when we, when we make these decisions, I, I think we, we have to think just a little bit further ahead that when we see what's going on with our growth and, and that we try to avoid, except where it's absolutely necessary, the quick fix and look towards the long-term solution, even if it's a little more painful. We've got to take into consideration what's going to be ahead of us you know, for example, I'm going to just take a wild guess that Commissioner Parker's phone and email blew up last week over the 726 home community that was proposed on, on Woodbine Road. These things are happening all over. And so I, I'm not going to belabor it. Uh, I know you guys will make the right decisions, but I just wanted to add that in. Thank you. Jeff, thank you, and thank you for your service on the Marine Advisory Committee. Appreciate it. I'm uh, Paul Wachowski. I live at 6209 Anderson Lane. I um, also go to church with Mr. Parker, just so you all know. Um, I'm a proponent of you got to pay for the future. So my recommendation would be spend the money now so that future developments will be granted the expertise and use of these roundabouts or whatnot. Uh, sorry, it's just you've this county has always been band-aid quick fix We've got to think long term and the long term is either roundabouts or four-way stops or signals um, going back to the presentation about uh, Berry Hill and South or West Spencerfield Road From when I've sat at that intersection there needs to be two additional turn lanes added to that intersection. One going east to turn south, and one going north to turn east. Uh, that would be my recommendation, but I'm not a traffic engineer. Um, I work for Navy Federal, and uh, I'm a senior loan officer there. So, gentlemen, I would recommend that spend the money now for the future endeavors of Santa Rosa County. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Good morning. My name is Pat France. I live at 5801 Shady Glen Court in Willow Glen. Um, I am on the board of the HOA there, and I know that our residents in that development are highly concerned about what's going on, um, and that's putting it mildly. Um, so I have two questions. Um, First of all, uh, I have looked at this as well as some of the other members, and um, our first question is, given the fact that there is no master plan, where does this fit in terms of are we going to do this and then develop a master plan for the developments, are we going to work the well the planning of the new developments coming and then do roads? Um, so that's, that's our first question. Uh, where does this fit with the master plan? Is it something we're going to do piecemeal? Or are we going to do the master plan and have one, you know, one big master plan with a timeline of when things are going to happen? Uh, and the second question is, is um, Commissioner Parker, this is for you, I guess. Um, I know there's a couple other developments that are concerned about this. Is if, if we can get some of the other HOAs together, and maybe some of them have already had meetings with you, I don't know. Uh, would it be possible to have a sit down with us and maybe a couple others, three other ones that are in this area? Would it be possible to have a sit down and talk about this? A absolutely, I am. Um, <clears throat> I appreciate you coming. Believe it or not, I 
hadn't been contacted by anybody from from down there on Carlin that I know of uh, within the past week or so on this. Of course, as I, I stated, and, and it's nice that Channel 3 News is here because I went back and when I did a Google search, that we actually covered this for the first time in February of 2017. And, and, and I, the reason I think that's important is for even the folks, a refresher of folks that are here that maybe this is your first meeting or maybe you come to meetings all the time. But I mean, this is an issue that now we're a full year and a half later just getting to this point. And that is unfortunately a painful reality of government that I'm Absolutely. starting to learn more. Uh, so I've known this has been a problem since before I ran. I heard about it plenty, uh, you know, when I when I ran for office and talked with folks. I've heard about it since then. And and, and as the traffic study warranted, I think would would um, kind of back up the the realities of even though there's there's always uh, probably more than two sides to every fence. Uh, as he stated with the, the traffic cacheting, um, uh, north and south is, is where there are the tremendous amount of traffic. And, and so you do hear a lot, of, a lot of things when you're out and about the community, especially being elected countywide. It's not always just uh, like Westminster Field, even though it sits in my district uh, in its entirety. Uh, I'm pretty sure that the bulk, uh, I guarantee uh, the vast majority of folks that are traveling north on Westminster Field are actually driving to uh, Mr. Salter's district. And a large part that are traveling north on Eastminster Field are traveling to Mr. Cole's district. Right. And, and that's the beautiful thing about being elected countywide is we don't necessarily um, microcosm things that unfortunately would harm others. Uh, I sell that absolutely more than willing to meet. I mean, we could, uh, you name the time and place, and as long as I don't have a conflicting thing, we'll meet with anybody. Um, you know, and, and I think staff, even Mr. Furman or Mr. Blaylock can maybe even speak more to your first question as far as piecemeal. They were here, I know Commissioner Salter and I believe Commissioner Cole were even here when you were added. Uh, I don't know if staff is, is comfortable on the spot of maybe giving you back why why these were even initially installed, but I believe uh, I believe Mr. Long hit it on the head when it was sort of as a traffic calming device. From everything I've heard from the history, it was just, hey, we've got a problem with speeders, let's put them in. Um, and again, I don't want to put staff on the spot if they're willing to say, but I don't believe based on all the information I've seen presented to me with staff uh, and DOT regulations that stop signs are the appropriate method for that. Um, I don't know if that's something they want to, to, to chime in or not, but uh, to answer you is, is it part of the, the master plan or do we, do we piecemeal things? I, so there are many factors such as Mr. Marker brought up, uh, the ultimate, you know, they say that the dollar's king. I mean, that, that is the ultimate, what things can we do? Uh, you know, when we talk about the, the master plan that we've now sent out to RFQ and Again, that's a lengthy process. That's another, when you look at how long Navarre's taken, that's over a year and a half before that process is there. Right. So would I say that I'd be willing to wait for improvements? Personally, no, I think this is affecting, we've got the data, thousands of residents every day get, get affected by this and every week and it compounds to wait another year and a half for another study to come out to say, well, how can we implement this? I don't think it's necessary. And a lot of that is, uh, if you sort of follow in the Navarre plan, is based on uh, zoning and aesthetic type right. things. It's not so much functionality of intersections. So, um, you know, and, and I, I definitely appreciate what everybody says. Hey, think more long term. I mean, that was one of the big reasons I think that after God laid it on my heart to run, sort of pushed me into running was, I mean, I, I live here, I travel these corridors almost daily. Um, you know, and, and I've seen the problem become progressively uh, more congestion over the last 12 or 13 years since we had the first building boom and then now that I'm going to say the post-recession building boom. But, um, you know, ultimately a lot of that comes to funding. This board, before I was here, uh, has made the decisions on numerous occasions to roll back the tax rate, uh, the millage rate. So, um, you know, and, and the, the citizens in 2006 made the decision to vote no on the local option sales tax. So a lot of those reasons, I didn't necessarily know the, the, the depth right. of why they were made before I was in office, but I can tell you now with the voluminous amount of information I have, 
is that unfortunately there's not always the funding whether and I, and I feel certain that we're right here on the the doorstep of another tax cut in November we're gonna have a another homestead exemption on the ballot it'll be on the ballot statewide I feel uh, extremely certain I've heard Chairman Cole even state, you know, um, in a meeting that, that he'll probably even vote for it, uh, in the premise of, hey, you could you could save taxes, you could save property taxes, but that's going to be another five uh, plus or minus million dollars cut to our budget. So the reality is, is um, you know, sometimes we're faced with no perfect option, but it's do we make an option that it will improve it, but it's not the best option, or do we just sit back and watch it compound? Uh, and I don't believe that that's the best option either. Um, and maybe to address your first one, but your second question, absolutely. Uh, I guarantee you when you get done and you don't have to wait for the whole meeting, if you'll go over here, uh, we'll have uh, Mr. Murray uh, direct you to Judy, we'll get your phone number. I mean, we could have an appointment set by the end of the day, okay. whenever you feel comfortable with whoever you want. Okay. And, um, and and maybe, uh, you know, what, whatever you need to come. Uh, come out of that I've, I've heard two of the the board and and these guys are teaching me how to count the three so I've, I've, I've learned a little bit uh, over two years say that hey we need more time to digest this and and so uh, you know what I would hope today is maybe the board would be willing to direct staff to come back with some of their recommendations based on this and give us time to chew on it more and maybe in our set of meetings later in the month then we could come back that would have time for input from the citizens as always every meeting uh, no matter what it is including I think we got budget meetings coming up uh, either tomorrow evening or Wednesday evening um, lo we love to have the public here uh, this is your money and we're, we're endowed with being able to you know the community we all live in but uh, that would be my hope today is that maybe we can all digest this we can have a few weeks to talk with staff and then maybe come back to look at making some decisions to improve things you know that will affect okay. you know people's lives to the tune of how much time they could spend with their families each day okay. and they had one last question um, the last question they had the one that was important to several of our members was um, I, I forget where it was on Facebook and I and Commissioner Parker I don't remember whether you made the statement but somewhat somewhere there was a statement made that they noticed a growth starting three years ago and there the question that some of our members had was why why did it take three years to decide to do a master plan if it was recognized that three years ago there there was a growth spurt yeah, I, I think I, I don't feel like that's a statement that I would have made maybe maybe and, and again context. I I don't remember I see so much on Facebook so, so I'll say this this board did have the foresight to have staff create the pace uh, area plan that was done over a decade ago I have a copy on my desk it was never uh, I want to say integrated or implemented as, as far as in our land development code it was a lot of suggestions um, there's a few things that during the recession uh, this board made some some decisions that and I hope to God I'm never faced with and that was they had a massive staff reduction we had to let a lot of employees go um, and so now we don't really have the resources staff doesn't feel comfortable to take on the master plan themselves uh, when Commissioner Williamson brought forward to do a Navarre master plan again that was I believe March of last year just to give you a time frames perspective so a year and a half ago uh, you know the cost on that is is over a hundred thousand dollars so you don't want to pull the trigger on something like that until you're certain of it and I was very clear when I met with several of my staff members about doing one for pace over a year ago, I remember me and Mr. Shepler had this conversation. I wanted to wait and see what came out of that Navarre master plan so that we could see, is this something we want to spend a hundred plus thousand dollars on? I mean, that is serious money uh, to do. And part of the way the time frame was purposely set up this time is before we even select a firm, which would be scheduled for around the November, December time frame, if things go in order, we will see the product from the Navarre pasture plan. And that way, before we expend any of your hard-earned taxpayer dollars, we're able to see what would this buy us and is this worth the investment? And um, that is, I know unfortunately it takes a long time, but I haven't uh, been able to come up with a better way to make sure that I'm investing your money properly. Um, I can assure you that the way the system's set up as far as each commissioner living in their district, uh, I think that is a huge value added to you because 
I don't need an engineer to tell me that traffic stacks up here because I see it every week. Commissioner Salter doesn't need us to know that Spencer Field or Woodbine need improvement. He sees it every week. Commissioner Cole sees the struggles that downtown Milton deals with on traffic as well as, you know, right. I could go on and on. So um, I assure you, you have representation. I mean, that's why I'm working on this project. That's why the wisdom of this board said, hey, Let's get a study done. Let's know some more alternatives and, and repercussions of that before uh, we pull the trigger on making some changes or spend the money, even as the chairman stated today. Uh, so I think you have good representation, and I don't want you to, I surely don't feel just because we haven't had an updated plan that doesn't mean that we're not looking at issues. Um, you know, and, and again, a lot of that ultimately comes down to funding. I know uh, this board, hands down, and even Sheriff Hall stated if, if the citizens would have voted for that sales tax in 2006, which we only lost by a few hundred votes, Woodbine Road would be four lane right now. Um, but ultimately, it comes down when the citizens, uh, just like on this homestead exemption, if they vote for that, they're telling us they want to spend less tax dollars, they want to see less services. I don't know how else to conduce from it. You know, if they say we want to pay less taxes, obviously, you know, we don't have the money to spend, so we've got to do the best we can. And I, I think these gentlemen have done a good job. Uh, you know, I'm sure not going to go back and criticize because, like I said, now a lot of times it's it's more complicated than just A or B. Okay. All right, thank you very much. Yes, ma'am. And you'll see Mr. Murray, yes, he, he can Mr. get you a phone number to Judy or something to set up a meeting. Mr. Salt. Ma'am, I'm, I'm going to make a few comments. I won't be long. Talking about long range planning and uh, master plans, before I became a county commissioner, I worked for a company. We were all about five year plans, 10 year plans. But a plan is only a plan unless you have funding for it. And back in 2006, like Commissioner Parker said, we had a wonderful traffic master plan that was a four-lane Woodbine Road, part of Berry Hill Road. And unfortunately, the citizens, by 300 votes, said no. But that would have really made an improvement in Santa Rosa County. And it wasn't the commissioners who turned it down. It was the citizens who said, no, we don't want to pay more. Back in 2007, when the Depression recession hit, Commissioner Lynch has talked about this many times, we lost $13 million out of our general revenue. We cannot build roads and courthouses and things like that with general revenue. We still haven't totally recovered from that $13 million uh -huh. that we lost back in 2007. And that's why it's, it's, I'm so happy that the citizens, two years ago, approved the half-cent sales tax. Without the half cent sales tax, we wouldn't be able to do hardly any additional road work. We would be able to just basically maintain what we have. So it's extremely important for people to understand we're only going to do what y'all support us to do. And the half cent sales tax is a wonderful thing. And hopefully one day we'll be able to come back and say this is what we've done with it. We ask you for a one cent so we can get Woodbine Road, four lane, take care of all these roads that need to be taken care of. But we can't do it without y'all's support, so thank you. Okay, thank you. And can I add one thing before you leave? Sure. Just very quickly. I, sure. Uh, when we talk master planning, a lot of people, I, I don't want people to leave with the impression that when we master plan, we can tell a developer, no, don't build that 100 homes. Uh, we plan corridors, we plan traffic patterns, and, and items like that can be planned. And, and as Commissioner Soller said, if you don't have the money, you can't initiate the plan. Okay. But I think a lot of people may have the misconception that when we're master planning, we look at a 100-acre piece of property and north end of Pace and can tell a developer, well, that's not in our plan for you to build 100 homes there. We can't do that. You buy a lot in Pace and you want to build a home, that's your right as a landowner to build a lot. If a developer builds, buys 100 acres that, that can have 100 homes on them, then this board has no ability to stop that in a master plan or any other kind of planning. Now, we could curtail that developer if they come to us and say, well, we want to increase this to 200 homes over the 100 that were allowed, then we have some input. But I, I just don't want people to leave or, or have the misconception that if we do planning, we could curtail. Uh, we, we don't have the traffic, we don't have the roads, we don't have the school, so therefore you guys should 
tell him he can't build that 100 homes. We, we don't have that ability to do that, even if we have a master plan. So, so there's, there's no update legislated anywhere that says every five years you have to provide a master plan, a 10-year plan moving forward anyway. So there's nothing that legislates it that has to be done and be approved by the, by the state or, or whatever. There's no mandate for updating and, and providing that to, I, I'm, I'm drawing on my knowledge. I was an elected official in Delaware where we moved from. We were required by law to have a five-year plan and a 10-year plan. And then during that course of that time as it ran, we were allowed to make updates, but we had to get it approved again. So uh, that's that's my question, if it makes clear well, what I'm, I'm asking. Sure. Well, sure. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I, I think this, this sort of gets to what Commissioner Cole was was uh, was talking about, the, the concept that people have, or the misconception people have about what a master plan is. What you're referring to, our analog to that, is the comprehensive plan. And it is updated okay. every, is it five years? Every five years okay. our comprehensive right. plan is updated. The master plan for land development is our land development code, which incorporates okay. zoning and the comprehensive plan. So okay. that's the master plan that's in effect throughout the county. Um, that's the, the root of all development. So if someone, okay. as Commissioner Cole said, the master plan right now is dictated by the zoning district that yes. the property is in. Yes. So if someone buys property that's zoned R1, we can't prohibit them from developing it according to the land development code that's in place at this okay. time. Um, and then we update our comprehensive plan every five years and do minor updates throughout that five-year plan. Okay. If a developer comes in uh, and requests a, a modification to the comprehensive plan, if there's a, a change that dictates that, then we have public hearings. Uh, okay. We send that modification to the state. It comes back to the county. We have another hearing uh, before it's implemented. So okay. that type of that, that, that high-level planning that's been in place since the 80s, I guess. 86 was okay. when our zoning and land development code or comprehensive plan uh, uh, sprung into being, uh, statewide zoning. Okay. So that is in place. It's updated every five years, and actually there are incremental updates um, uh, within that period. But we have that in place. That's the master plan, I guess, that, that people can go to and rely on. They want to see what property okay. is, is, is uh, capable of being used for. Okay, thank you. I appreciate the education. We've been here three years, so I'm still learning. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. We are too. <laughs> okay, any other comments? All right. Then we're going to move on to the administrative committee agenda. Uh, item number one under administrative committee is a non medical transportation permit. This is a discussion of the application from Wheelcare LLC. Uh, for a permit to operate non-medical transportation services in San Rosa County. This is pretty much a boilerplate annual renewal. Any questions or comments? If not, I'll move that to consent agenda on Thursday. Hearing none passes. Item two is emergency air tran uh, ambulance transportation permit. This is a approval of issuance of a certificate of conveyance and necessity obtained pertaining to the operation of emergency air ambulance transportation services for MedTrans Corporation doing business as Shan's, uh, Shan Seacare. Uh, questions or comments on that? If not, I'll move that to the consent agenda on Thursday. So passed. Item three, sidewalk improvements uh, on Northrop Road. This is a discussion of approval to share 50% of the cost of approximately $10,000 with the city of Milton for sidewalks and improvements on Northrop Road. We have Councilman Jeff Snow here with us today. Councilman, would you like to go over some of this with us, please? Uh, Chairman, Commissioners, thank you for having me today. I'm here representing uh, the mayor, our city council, and our, our staff. Uh, we've been working uh, our staff's been working with uh, your staff. I've, I've worked with Bob Cole on this project. Uh, this sidewalk basically runs from Berry Hill Road uh, uh, north on Northrop uh, up past uh, North Hills subdivision. Uh, basically, we have uh, 
children walking from Star Hill, which is all the way from uh, Dogwood Drive in Milton, all the way uh, through North Hills, through Las Colinas, and the Collins Mill Creek uh, development there with a lot of townhomes. A lot of kids there are walking. Uh, it's kind of a treacherous side where they're walking through. They're cutting through a lot of yards, and uh, uh, w we know that this is this part is a is a county road, but uh, we feel uh, obligated also as a city with the kids that we could do a, a, a partnership here, work together with the county, and uh, split basically half the cost on this. Uh, we have a service provider for the sidewalk. Uh, we're asking for a commitment up up to eleven thousand dollars, and we'll throw in at least ten ourselves. And I, I believe, I don't have the uh, stat on the length of it, but I think it's over a thousand foot, which will eventually connect. Uh, we have a, another uh, program going in where we're putting in $800,000 worth of sidewalks uh, for schools, and that will connect to that uh, shortly. Okay. Thank you for being here today, Jeff. And I, I appreciate working with the mayor and yourself on this project and uh, your new city manager. So. Any other comments or questions from board? We've all seen how, uh, how valuable sidewalks are in all locations of the county and how, how much they're being used today. So uh, the funding would come from District 2 LOST funds. So if there's no other comments or questions, I'd like to, anybody from the public? All right, and I'd like to move this to Thursday's consent agenda without objection. Hearing none, it passes. All Jeff, right. start pouring some cement. Let's get let's get it going. We really appreciate uh, y'all working with us, and uh, we enjoy working with y'all. You've made it real easy, and we appreciate all the help you've done, Bob. Great. All right, thank, thank y'all. All right, uh, item number four: state and federal lobbying services discussion of renewal of contracts with Edmund Graber, and governmental affairs, and Johnson and Blanton governmental relations, Mr. County Administrator, comments? Uh, yes, sir. Just um, on the Johnson and Blanton, the state contract, this is actually just an early renewal to synchronize it with our um, budget year. Um, their contract doesn't expire till the end of the year, but I wanted to, to, to link it up with the budget. And then this is just uh, codifying the, the agreement we've had with Mr. Graber um, over the years in, in a similar uh, a similar agreement, just a slightly different uh, scope of work and, and fees. Comments, questions from board? Yes, sir. Uh, yes, sir. I'll be very short. I know I'm probably the only one swimming upstream on this. Uh, I would just ask that it be moved to regular agenda instead of consent. I don't know it at this time. I, I'm going to take full responsibility myself. I just don't feel like I personally have enough information uh, that I can get to a yes vote on 130,000 plus being spent on lobbyists. Right. It's perfectly understandable. I questioned that myself when I was fresh on the board, but I think you'll find as time goes on, it's almost an impossibility for us to do our job and, and keep all the bases covered without some help. So uh, we'll move that to the regular agenda on Thursday. Hearing no objections, so passed. Item five is surplus property. Discussion of declaration is surplus property items from the San Rosa County Road and Bridge Landfill and various departments as recommended by Mr. Spencer's office. Any questions or comments? Seeing none, that will go to the consent agenda on Thursday. So passed. Discussion uh, number six is discussion and approval of agreement with uh, Blue Dag LLC. Mr. Shebler. Uh, yes, sir. The, uh, as previously approved by the board, we're developing a, a countywide ADA transition plan. This is a software license um, that allows us access um, to a database and software that will track um, all of the reviews that are conducted on our facilities, first of all, and then as we expand that countywide to the different uh, elements uh, of that ADA plan. So it, it allows us to execute the ADA transition plan that, that was previously approved. And when you say it covers all bases on this, uh, parks? We're, we're looking at parks um, and, and our facilities first as a priority. And then we would get to other things, sidewalks, crossings, that sort of stuff throughout the development of the plan. All right. Any other comments, questions? Move the consent agenda on Thursday without objection. So moved. Item 7, ordinance to re 
uh, for repealing Chapter 13 special districts. This is a discussion to advertise a public hearing repealing Chapter 19 special districts shores of Santa Rosa Community Development District. Mr. Shebler? Actually, that would probably be me. Uh, All right. The, uh, <laughs> the Community Development District is a, uh, uh, a financing, essentially, uh, uh, entity that's put in place by a uh, owner developer uh, to provide for improvements in the subdivision. Um, I put one in place for Jubilee when that was going forward. This one was one that was put in place uh, for the south end of the county on some, some town front property. The development never went forward. The district never uh, had any type of, uh, of life. The uh, Department of Economic Opportunity reviews these things, and if it determines that they're, quote, inactive, they request the um, commission, the local government, to repeal that ordinance. It doesn't have any, any uh, real existence anyway. So that's what they're asking for. All right. Comments or questions? Is there anybody here that from that district that had a question about that from the public? Saying none, I'll move that for approval to the consent agenda on Thursday. Hearing none, so passed. Item, item 8 is a letter of request for time extension for the Defense Infrastructure Grant Agreement. This is approval of the forthcoming amendment number 1 to the agreement S0035, extending the period of performance through June 30th, 2019, an authorization to execute all relevant, relevant documents. Dan, is there anything we need to discuss on this? Pretty much paperwork. All right, any comments, questions from anybody? All right, I'll move that to consent agenda on Thursday. Hearing no objections, so moved. Item nine, annual contract with the Florida Department of Health. This is a discussion of this contract for 2018-19 fiscal year. Florida Department of Health for operation of Santa Rosa County Health Department. Again, we're at that time of the year where we're renewing contracts. Any comments, questions from anybody on this? Seeing none, so move to the consent agenda. Item 10, uh, Settlers Colony Drainage Expansion Construction Bid Recommendation. This is a discussion of one approval of the low base bids from Utility Service Company in the amount of $2,589,113.69 for the north area portion and from Robertson Underground Utility in the amount of $2,993 $2,993,904, excuse me, for the south area portion and authorization to execute contracts contingent upon FEMA's approval to extend the period of performance deadline to align with the construction period, and two, allocating an additional $2,600,000 $263,226.69 from LOST funding. That's a lot of money. It's a lot of words, too. All right. Now that I've got it pretty well confused for everybody, is there any questions about what we're doing? Commissioner Lynchard, this is in your district. Any comments, sir? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. No, these are uh, very large HMGP projects. Just uh, a note that this is contingent upon receiving that approval from uh, FEMA for the uh, extension of the performance period. Uh -huh. Dan, we got uh, pretty good reasoning for the request for the extension, I guess. Y yes, sir, we do, and, and it's been submitted through the state. The state supported the request and forwarded that on to FEMA. We expect to hear back hopefully in the next two to three weeks on that. Um, and the matching share just there is no additional federal money in this grant so that's why the additional money is coming from local and it takes our matching share from 25 to 28 percent okay well it's very very much needed and commissioner lynchard you've been working on it pretty hard so hopefully we'll get our extension on this thing so all right uh anybody any reason not to move that to the consent agenda on thursday okay all right uh, so move to the consent agenda Item 11 is uh, event request. This is discussion of approval of the following event request. One is 
Kindergarten, Inc.'s request to utilize the grassy area at Florida Town Park for a outdoor nature play class from September 11, 2018 to November 16, 2018. And as outlined on the attached schedule, and the other item is the Pink Pirates of Navarre request to decorate a portion of Navarre Park in October for Breast Cancer Awareness Month. I will move both those items unless there's comments or questions to the consent agenda. Seeing none, so moved. Uh, under Economic Development Committee, item one is Paradise Advertising Agency's contract renewal. This is a discussion of a renewal of the tourism advertising contract with Paradise Advertising Agency for one year. I think we've seen some very good results from that. And uh, if there's no comments or questions, move that to consent agenda on Thursday. So moved. Item two is AD ADA compliant beach accessibility mat. This is a discussion of approval of the Board of County Commissioners for funding the purchase of a uh, disc chomps, the, these, the champs, mats and systems incorporated, ADA compliant beach mat accessibility mat in the amount of $3,473. These have been a big hit, and uh, along with the uh, water wheelchairs, they've uh, done a lot to improve our ADA, uh, not only compliance, but the satisfaction of the people that need to use them. So I'll move that to consent agenda on Thursday. Without objection, hearing none, it passes. Item three is special event application for March Madness, Monarch Madness. This is an application from the Panhandle Butterfly House to host the annual Monarch Madness Festival at the Navarre Park on October 6, 2018 from 10 a.m. to 4 p.m. And let's hope the butterflies get this message. So we'll have that. Uh, we'll move that to the consent agenda on Thursday without objection. Hearing that passes. Item four, Governor's Job Growth Grant Fund Applications. This is a recommendation of the board for approval of the application of the jo Governor's Job Growth Grant Fund for the I-10 Industrial Park and Randy, and Randy Brown Road. Comments or questions? So this is just the, the annual appropriation that the Florida Legislature made um, of $85 million. Um, we have two, these two grant applications uh, ready to go. We'll submit those um, to the state for consideration under that program. Okay. All right. Hopefully we'll be successful and get some aid in those roads. So any other comments, questions? Okay. Hearing none, it passes to the consent agenda on Thursday without objection. <coughs> Item five, Triumph term sheet approval for Whiting Aviation Park. Dan? Yes, sir. Eric is here to answer any specific questions. We've been uh, working with the Triumph staff um, on the draft term sheet that we provided um, last month. Uh, it will go to the Triumph board on uh, Wednesday. Uh, in the negotiations back and forth, there was um, some consideration trying to add additional um, clawback clauses, a, a hybrid option, which the Triumph um, staff has uh, declined uh, our request to include that. So it's the term sheet that you were presented with uh, last month and that will go to the Triumph Board on Tuesday. It keeps our, pro our project and our uh, application moving forward to an uh, agreement th at the next Triumph Board is what would be anticipated for that uh, Whiting Aviation Park project. So although we didn't get uh, that additional clause added in there, I think we, are, we, we tried and we're satisfied and we, we are certain that we can meet um, one of those uh, requirements in the clawback provisions uh, as they are written. All right. Eric, do you have something else? And the Triumph meeting is this Wednesday, so we're actually requesting approval at today's meeting as opposed to Thursday's meeting, so that we'll be able to move forward on Wednesday. All right. Eric, stay up here, if you would, please. Uh, okay, so uh, any objections to approval of the recommendation of item number five for the Triumph term sheet approval? Uh, moving that to, to a recommendation for today. Hearing none, it passes. All right, Eric, if I could, uh, also on Thursday, wouldn't you say it's on Wednesday? Yes, sir. Will they be discussing the application for the uh, sewerage plant? I don't believe that's on the agenda. Could you check it and let me know? It's not on the agenda, so, sir. Okay. No, sir. Right, thank you. Okay, thanks. Appreciate it. All right, at this time, we'll go to the engineer's report. Mr. Blaylock. 
Thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the board. Our first item is a discussion of a contract modification to Chambers Construction for the Chipper Lane Maranatha Way drainage improvement. This is an HMGP project uh, in the additive amount of $116,700. The Board of Commissioners back in August of 2015 were approved by FEMA to proceed with the engineering design and permit. BDI was uh, selected and began their design in January of the following year. Uh, on March 12th of this, this year, the Board approved the uh, contract award to Chavers Construction in the amount of $1.149 million for the construction. We've got a scope modification that will expand the existing design pond by an additional three feet and we anticipate uh, participation at the same level from the state 7525 for the $116,700. All right we'll move that to Thursday's consent agenda without objection hearing none it passes. Commissioner Parker and Roger thanks for all your work on that. Thank you. Right, item two. Item number two is a discussion of the uh, engineering task orders. We, uh, the Board of County Commissioners advertised for continuing engineering services uh, as it related to our LOST projects on under, to be underway. Uh, the board uh, selected the six firms. Uh, we, uh, they also identified the projects uh, that each one of them would be awarded. We have scope and fee for each one of those six firms uh, listed in the backup. Um, the dollars being funded are the FY18 and 19 LOST, as well as road and bridge reserves and some TDT dollars. So uh, if the board has any questions specifically for any project, we happy to answer those, but we're asking for approval of all six firms, scope and fees. Comments, questions from the board? Just so Mr. Parker. Just one question, Roger. Uh, any idea, and, and if not, that's fine. I know it's on the spot of, um, in particular, if we look at the last billet that um, Southern Site Utility Design is getting that Hamilton Cove Pond design, any idea how long we could expect before that design would be complete so that then we could be looking at the next phase, which would be? I don't have on top of my head, but certainly I'll look in the backup. It should be, it should be included in that scope. Okay, thank you. All right. Any other comments, questions? If not, consent agenda on Thursday without objection. So move. Item three. Item number three is a discussion of approval of our one-year uh, extension of the contract with the Florida State University to provide mosquito surveillance and testing for our physical year 2018-19. Physical year. Questions? Seeing none, move the consent agenda on Thursday without objection. So move. And Four. item... Item number four is a discussion of approval of the Jody Oaks preliminary plant. Uh, this is a subdivision that's uh, trying to get approval. They're working their way through our staffs, our engineering staff and planning staff to be uh, able to remain on the agenda and we'll make that determination later this week. Right, we'll move it to Thursday's uh, regular agenda if it makes it. So moved. Item number five is uh, Soundside Shore second edition final plat. Uh, discussion of the final plat. It too is working to try to get approval on in Thursday's meeting. All right, same as the last one. We'll put it on regular agenda if it makes a cut. So moved. And Hamilton Crossings. This is construction plans for uh, a subdivision. It, it too is proposed for Thursday's agenda. All right. Is it, we have the same thing on number seven? Num, no, no, actually number seven, I would okay. like a little discussion right, and, good. and okay, projection so possibly. Number six will move to the regular agenda if it makes a cut. Without well, objection, so moved. Uh, item seven. Item number seven is discussion of approval of the Parkwoods Commons uh, revised turn lane orientation. Uh, if I can have that, that one projected, please. Uh, that is not this is engineering item seven please okay. uh, with that we can go uh, to item number eight in the interim while they're pulling that up and that's a discussion of the approval of heather's place phase two 
construction plans. Uh, the construction plans were revised and we're asking for board approval to uh, approve the revised construction plans. Are there any comments or questions on item number eight? Seeing none so passed. Uh, Here we go. Okay. Item number seven is Parkmore Commons turn lane. Initially, uh, Adams is right there above the, uh, the bar there you see. That's Adams Road. Initially, they, they had proposed to put turn lanes in to the subdivision off of Adams Road. Uh, that was approved a number of years ago. Uh, it, it, the preliminary plat was approved uh, in just a moment. Uh, got on the wrong page here. This, this subdivision was initially approved back in 07 and construction plans also in November of 07. And it was called up during the recession and it sat idle for a number of years. Uh, it was acquired. Uh, by a uh, developer who completed phase one and in phase two initially there were turn lanes proposed on Adams Road with the subdividing of those single-family dwelling units on the south side of Adams the construction of turn lane is going to significantly impact those lots and what we have proposed to do is to take those turn lanes and move them out to Schmuckla Highway with a right turn uh, on Schumacher Highway in lieu of constructing them into Parkside Drive. And so engineering staff's making that recommendation. And that, this would be the contractor's obligation? At his, his, at his expense, that is correct. Okay. Commissioner Parker, this is in your district. Yes, sir. Uh, this is another one of those projects, like I told the, <laughs> that lady earlier, I've started discussions on well over a year ago uh, with a new developer which is Thomas Holmes Corporation uh, I've had an opportunity I uh, I'll even call on people in the audience I'm gonna guess I was wondering what mr. Saber was doing here today I'm gonna guess this is probably the issue um, I've, I've talked with several people along that road and and I'm sure that we have legal authority and whatnot that we could continue to do it however um, for the Adams Road not being near the traffic of a major thoroughfare from the experience that I've seen and, and the fact that a lot of those folks on that road um, even though it is a right of way they sort of are used to that being their front yard uh, and their concrete driveways which would would probably uh, lead to it being a rational assumption would be almost cut in half uh, so I have uh, told the developer as well as the homeowners that I've spoke with in that area uh, that I am supportive of us not um, capturing, uh, for lack of a better term, half of their front yard to do that roadway, and and I think we'd have some some very upset folks in that area. So I would I would um, be supportive of this turn lane amendment. Um, I think it goes. I've, I've visited the site at least uh, probably close to a half dozen times out there for conversations, whether it be with homeowners or with the, uh, the developer, and it just seems to make sense. And, and I know um, Chris Phillips and, and Roger have spent a lot of time looking at this. I'm very appreciative uh, of them. Uh, I kind of hate to throw it out there on the spur, but I can't help myself. I, I do know that we have a, a representative. Uh, we, we have been discussed many times uh, about the possible connection, even if it was just for pedestrian uh, thoroughfare from the Parkmore Commons up to uh, that Pace Mill Way area for kids to uh, get to school to try to continually working on that interconnectivity and reduce the traffic congestion. I don't know if, uh, I know there's at least one representative from uh, the development north of there. I don't know if they wanted to speak on that today or not. I at least wanted to afford that opportunity. Um, but if not, then then uh, I would move for approval of this on the consent agenda. Without objection. Without objection. <laughs> so passed. So. All right, thank you. All right, Public Service Committee, Commissioner Williamson's not here today, Commissioner Lyncher, but we don't have any items on there, so thank you. Public Works Committee, Commissioner Salter. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I have one item. <clears throat> Discussion of request from Pace Water System for a blanket utility easement through the Metron Estates East Stormwater Pond and the La Floresta Stormwater Pond for the installation of a gravity sewer line. Dan? I'll Our, defer to Mr. Furman over there. 
Thank you, Mr. Chairman. A uh, Pace Water System approached us about eliminating a sewage pumping station in Metron States, bypassing that with a gravity system that would go to their existing pumping station in the La Foresta subdivision. To get to that from one lift station to the other, their best route is through two separate retention ponds, one there in Metron Estates, one of our, and then the other is in La Foresta. And so they've asked us if we can grant or be willing to grant them an easement for their gravity sewer construction through the southern portion of the ponds. And speaking to Mr. Andrews this morning, um, we feel that perhaps a blanket easement may not be the most appropriate, that maybe just giving them an easement across the southern portion of those retention ponds um, might be um, serve their purpose, but just not be open-ended uh, across the, the ponds. Either way, I think their routing is going to be um, to their advantage uh, through our berms on the retention ponds, not through the bottom of the retention pond. So I don't think it's going to make much difference to them. Uh, they have not designed to the uh, final degree the, the routing of the sewer lines because they were waiting to see if we'd be willing to grant them the easements. Thank you, Stephen. Commissioner Parker, do you have any? Thank you, Commissioner. The only comment I have is I, I believe their legal counsel is present today as well, and I just hope that they'll convey that uh, I know this is the second or third time since I've been on the board where we have absolutely uh, worked with Pace Water and, and, and at no charge, and I hope that their board of directors will remember that when I come in the near future to ask for uh, them to return the favor when we try to put a splash pad in there at Benny Russell. I know that will be a board action, but that would save uh, be a great amenity to the community and maybe make it financially possible if they could return that favor by helping us on some of those sewer fees. So uh, I would move this for approval without objection uh, would be my recommendation. I, I did have a comment that went right along with that. Commissioner Cole. Uh, so many times in the past we've, we've been very amenable to all the utilities, and I would just like to reiterate what Commissioner Parker said. Hopefully we'll get that returned, uh, i.e. tap fees, whatever it happens to be. But uh, uh, I think, you know, in Santa Rosa County we work pretty well together with all the other uh, elected officials, and I'd like to do the same with the utilities. I asked Dan earlier if there was a way we could even put that in writing in this contract, and uh, we're always sitting down there smiling, but I think if we got enough witnesses and two local councils on both sides of the board that uh, they can make it hard on us when we come for a tap fee, but we can somewhere down the road payback's going to be, <laughs> be due. So, uh, Mr. Chairman. That, so. Mr. Chairman, excuse me. Uh, for just one last uh, item. When I was speaking with Pace Water System, the general manager, uh, he did offer uh, just as a when he was making this request that if the county has a need to expand either of these retention ponds, that they are looking to purchase the two acre parcel that lies between the two ponds. And if there was any opportunity for us to expand the retention pond, um, either one of them, that they would be willing to uh, work with us with that property that they're looking to buy. And they had uh, are working also with Pegasus Engineering Group that's working on the Metron Estates drainage design. And before they even approached uh, my department about this, they had been in contact with Pegasus to say they were looking at this expand or this sewer routing and purchasing this two acres, and that if part of the Metron Estates drainage project needed extra land to expand retention pond, that this would be um, available. So I just wanted to give them credit that they did uh, come in not with their hands out, but with their hands open, saying, "Hey, let's let's work a deal." Thank you, Mr. Andrews. You had your light on earlier. Um, yes, sir. I was just going to say that I have spoken with Mr. Furman about this, and blanket easement is uh, is a little overbroad, but we can define it before the the final document is executed. So the motion stays the same. An easement as opposed to a blanket easement. Okay. So we're going to strike blanket and just come up, with, just use the word easement. Don't All right, work. Mr. Chairman, acknowledging that change, I would move this to Thursday's consent agenda without objection. Hearing none, so passed. That concludes my report. Thank you. Thank you. Commissioner Lynchard for budget and finance.
Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Item number one is a bid action for housing re rehabilitation, discussion of award for the housing rehabilitation project at 1449 <coughs> Bell Creek Road to Adam Moats Construction as the lowest priced qualified bidder meeting specifications. Unless there are any questions, I'll move that to Thursday's consent agenda without objection. Okay. Item two is another bid action, discussion of award for the Optimus Park Restrooms Accessibility Alterations Project to McDelt LLC <clears throat> as the lowest priced qualified bidder meeting specifications. I'll move that to Thursday's consent agenda without objection. Hearing that passes, and my compliments go out to Tammy and everybody that took a part in the uh, recent uh, upgrade to Optimus Park. It's been very well received by the public, and this is just another key part of that. Thank you. Thank you. Items three, four, five, and six are budget amendments uh, recognizing funding, uh, departmental funding, uh, increased costs for sheriff utilities, and then a task order for the central landfill air operations permit. Unless there are any questions on those individually, I will move that to Thursday's consent agenda without objection. Bring that and passes. Items 7, 8, 9, and 10 are carry forwards, uh, correction, uh, and allocations for expenditures, uh, and a, a recognition of receipt of a, a grant for the Supervisor of Elections Department. Unless there are any questions on any of those items, I would move those to Thursday's <coughs> consent agenda without objection. Commissioner Lynch, if you would, uh, I'd like to move all those, but if you would, please read item 7 in the record. Uh, We've been dealing with quite a few complaints about Peter Prince Airport. I'd like to make sure folks recognize that we'll study. Do. Item 7 is discussion of Budget Amendment 2018-207 in the amount of $242,860 to carry forward funds for the Peter Prince Field Airport Improvement Plan and Noise Study and for the Maintenance Repair and Operation Study as approved at the June 14, 2018 meeting. Thank you, sir. Thank you. So moved. Uh, that brings us to item 11, which is discussion of approval of the check register. I will review that and have it on your desk Thursday, and I will move that to the consent agenda, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Uh, that's so moved. And that concludes the budget report. Thank, thank you very much, Commissioner Lynchard. At this time, we'll open the floor to the public forum. Is there anybody who would like to make a comment or has anything to bring to the board? Please come forward. Need your name and address for the record, and make sure you fill out a speaker's form. Good morning, uh, Louis Loveless. I live in uh, the Windsor Forest Development uh, Stafford Circle. Uh, I was here a few months ago uh, regarding the the roads issue that we have. Uh, I thought at first it was just my street, but uh, it really has turned out that the whole development has some serious drainage issues that has resulted in the caving of parts of the road. Uh, the end of Stafford Circle is a great example of that, and that's why I was here a few months ago. Shortly after I came here, the, the roads crew did come out, put yet another patch on the road. This past weekend, for example, two more holes blew up, on it, and usually the roads cave in. These two blew out. We, and, and it's constantly, constantly wet to the point where uh, you know I believe and some of the neighbors uh, that it is a uh, a real issue that really has to be addressed and the patches on these things um, the past storm that we had uh, uh, Styles Road Lane uh, again I guess it's been I have photos that I took I went out during the storm to take the photos uh, the mailboxes on Stiles, the water is so high that half of the residents' mailboxes are covered. And this goes on for a few days. And shortly after that storm, the kids were back in session. So, you know, my question is, how are these kids getting to the bus? How the buses get down these streets? There's about four different sections in that development that are really problemsome. And it's been long term. Well, before I came here, these, these roads have been an issue, according to the residents. Um, I think maybe an engineer should should come into the development and really take a look at why 
you know, the roads are collapsing and the drainage is an, you know, as a resident, as a taxpayer, I think I deserve at least the same services as other developments that don't have this. Uh, and I can't speak for many that have the problems that I have just in Windsor Forest, we have a severe drainage issue to the point that the roads are collapsing and we're constantly putting that band-aid on there to just come out, dig it up, put a patch on that and then, you know, what is this, less than three months later, you know, today we have, if you went down to the end of Stafford, you would see that the road has blown up. And I have a Navy neighbor who rides his bike to and from work. You know, he comes home in the evening, it's dark. I mean, all it's gonna take is him to hit that one day when he's not aware that the road collapsed. You know, just for an example, we have kids. Okay, well, have, uh, Mr. Furman, you aware of this and what's your resolve or plans for this? Mr. Chairman, we are aware of the issues there in Windsor Forest. The issue on Stiles Lane is something that the residents are working with the Department of Environmental Protection on because there's an issue of ownership and maintenance of a retention pond. Uh, the developer has not done the maintenance and it restricts the ability of the water to get into that pond and so it does flood a low area in the street. Luckily it doesn't flood any residences there. It does create a, a problem. The residences are continually working with DEP to try to force the owner of the pond to, to make improvements that is seems to be moving forward but it's it's moving very slowly so hopefully you know that issue will be resolved you know in the in the coming year on um, uh, Stafford Circle the uh, where Mr. Lovelace lives the soil is very poor the water doesn't percolate in it does get under the asphalt and we are battling a um, a drainage problem there it's a subterranean drainage problem that you know we're going to have to come in probably and install extensive under drains under the roadway and it's going to be a rebuild of a large section of that road and I do have that project on a capital improvement list that I'll be presenting to Mr. Shebler here in the next couple of weeks with the cost estimates for it along with lots of other things of course but uh, it is something that we is is on our radar screen it's just gonna be a major project that we're just not set up to to tackle just yet and it will I'm sure take some engineering as he mentioned to get the appropriate fix in the ground so we're you know it didn't fall on deaf ears when you came a few you know a few weeks ago and uh, make sure we have your name contact information and county administrator will make sure you're kept aware of or abreast of where we're at with our actions on uh, getting both those problems corrected. So, all right. Two other issues that I just want to address, and I uh, I brought uh, one of them up the last meeting here uh, that I was at. <clears throat> one of the issues with the uh, the roads and bridges properly being maintenance, uh, you know, in a timely fashion or whatever, was the fact that uh, they were well understaffed. And when I spoke to somebody down in the, uh, the Roads and Bridges Department, I think at that time there was 30 vacancies that weren't filled, no applications. And then we got into why, because you know we, we did have the funding, we, we have the funding. Um, and it really came down to the uh, wages for these guys. And so uh, I was just wondering if there's been an, any, any follow-up as to making those positions a little more competitive to draw in you know workers to, to do those roads and bridges of work we have uh, county administrators looking at all the all the different budget ranges on on our salaries and another thing that's adding to that is just the the amount of uh, jobs or, or growth that's out there right now uh, there's people I know in uh, in all phases of construction that are begging for employees so even if even if we give the raise there's a lack of uh, just a lack of warm bodies out there to, to fill the to fill the vacancies uh, not just here in the county but also in the private sector so. okay in, if I could sir in this year's in this year's budget which the the board will hear uh, the first public budget hearing Wednesday night at 6 is a 15% um, increase in the starting salary for those um, road and bridge equipment operator positions. 
Okay, beautiful. I appreciate it. Uh, and, and this is the last thing, and I don't know if you guys are aware of it. Uh, in my neighborhood, again, I have, uh, it has been resolved, but I want to bring it to the, the board's attention. When I moved in almost two years ago, I had a dysfunctional fire hydrant. And it was, had the uh, black bag on it taped up, at basically not working. And so over the next year or so, I went between Pace Volunteer Fire Department and Pace Water on who's actually responsible for functioning it because that was the closest fire hydrant to my area. So for me, it's important just in case something was to happen. This went on for about a year and a half and shortly after I came to the last meeting, after I left here, I went both to the, again, to the Pace uh, <clears throat> Volunteer Fire Department and then to Pace Water because it, it appears that they were playing games with the definition between maintenance and repair. And because they were doing that, they were shifting it to blame the other party. And so I sat down with the PACE volunteer commissioner at the time, or the captain, whoever was on duty. He brought in a uh, volunteer firefighter who actually goes to all of the fire hydrants to maintenance them. And that's different from repair. And they brought all the notes out that uh, the re work requests that people over their time have sent, you know, just basically pushed around for repair. Uh, it really isn't the, the, the repair of these fire hydrants lays on the Pace Water Department. So when I finally went to them, they owned it. And they said, you know, and, and, and keep in mind, uh, the Pace Fire Department uh, told me that we have many fire hydrants that are not working. Okay, such as mine. Uh, but the Pace Water System owned, owned the problem that they needed to uh, get the, uh, the part to fix my particular fire hydrant, which two days later they came out and they did that after a year and a half of this game. But the guy at the Pace Water uh, also informed me that unless people like me come and, and scream about it, working fire hydrants in Santa Rosa is low priority that water to the residents is more important than the fire hydrant. And I found that a little disturbing because they do get a little extra cut out of our taxes. I think 50 cents goes to the Pace volunteer and 50 cents goes to uh, Pace Water for the maintenance and repair of these. But it should be concerning to the board that we have non-functioning fire hydrants. Mine was fixed right after you know the complaint, but you know, on behalf of the rest of the people who have fire hydrants that don't work, I mean, that, I mean, that could be a serious problem down the road. I just want to kind of address it to you guys, maybe look into it, and, you know, lay blame where it is and have them pay, uh, you know, the money that we've paid them to repair those and get them working. Uh, it is a serious problem, and, and this board took it up several years ago, and I'm glad you brought it back to our attention because I thought it was a, I thought it had been solved and taken care of, and Correct me if I'm wrong, somebody, but I thought Pace Water added a dollar a month to everybody's bill for that, and I thought we'd hashed all this out and had everything taken care of, and I don't like splitting hairs between maintenance and, and uh, you know, repairs. Basically, there should not be a fire hydrant in this county not functioning. Correct. Period. And I believe we even went as far as to... Uh, go to emergency services to where uh, and I have to follow up on this where if a fire hydrant's not functioning it's supposed to be reported emergency services so they can relay that to a fire truck or a fire dispatch uh, if that's the case so you know so they don't get there and find out firsthand that it's not working they know when they're dispatched it's not working so uh, Dan if we could follow up on all that I'd I appreciate that because it's something we ironed through several years ago and I thought was way behind us at this point. So we'll, we'll readdress that. Okay. Thank you very much for your time. Okay, thank you. <coughs> Mr. Chairman. Commissioner. Uh, I'm just going to ask Dan or Mark, do you think that's something that one of you could reach out to Pace Volunteer Fire District and get back with us on Thursday if they have a list of something that's inoperable so we can make sure I'm, before the end of the week. I'm contacting emergency management now. I'll talk with Brad and we'll, we'll see what we can bring back Thursday.
Anybody else? All right. We thank you all for attending today, and we are adjourned.